Hey, Rez, how's everybody doing? Come on, who's happy to be here today? All right, I'm looking around. I want you to know you look good. I see Jesus on you. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, Happy Mother's Day. Thank you for making God a priority today. And I want to give a shout out to those who are joining us online, our online campus. Thank you for making God a priority. And also I want to welcome those who are joining with us. We're one house with a few rooms. Uh, downtown Greeley, our campus there, and our Rio de Janeiro, Brazil campus. Can we welcome everybody who's joining with us? So glad you guys are with us today for part three of a message we're calling, a series we're calling Pharisectomy, uh, where we remove our inner Pharisee. Uh, and it helps us to prevent what we call around here religiously transmitted diseases. You're welcome. Hey, thanks for being here. I, I want to give a shout out to... Uh, To our worship team, you guys probably didn't realize that we didn't have a drummer today. Uh, They came through. The the drummer got a stomach virus, and uh, it was a last-minute thing. And instead of being uh, sad about it, they just said, we can make this happen. They programmed the drums uh, on a laptop. And uh, uh, I guess, yeah, Tim Cook played the drums for us today. I don't know. Anyway, so they did a great job and just demonstrated something uh, of, of overcoming and joy, and we had a great worship experience, didn't we? So anyway, very thankful for that uh, in the culture and that, that in the worship team as well. I want to start out with a, a, a scripture that I think will show you a culture that has influence. And I want to take this from a standpoint of, as we're looking at the Pharisectomy series, really what we're talking about is making sure that we're living a life of faith that is not removed from the kindness of God and the joy of the Lord. Just, just people that love God doesn't mean you have to be sad and mean. Thought you'd like to know that. And, uh, I'm glad that wasn't very sensational because it's true. And, uh, but anyway, so I want you to see the connection between joy and influence because anytime I preach messages on, on being kind to people or, or extending grace to people or being fun at parties, which Jesus was fun at parties, guys. You can see it all through the Bible. It offended the religious people, in fact. And when I talk about how important it is for us to be fun at parties and us to be salt uh, and light in the world, typically I'll get this question. Well, what about the hard stuff? When do we tell people the truth? Where's the line? Where's the line where I finally tell people what I really think? Right? And so I actually want to address that today. I want to talk about how to have difficult conversations with people But I want you to understand the mechanisms of influence as God created us to both give and receive uh, influence. With that in mind, I want you to see this in Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. All right, I want to just stop there. There's something in the culture of heaven that unlocks the inspiration to dream again. All right, and so there's something that it's like the, the, the world seems a little bit um, uh, less capped on what's possible when you walk with God. And then it says, our mouths were filled with laughter. Everybody say laughter. And our tongues with songs of joy. So you see there's a, there's a, a, a culture that's inspired. People are dreaming again because God has shown up for these people in the book of Psalms and, and they're starting to reconnect with joy. They're, they're, their mouths are filled with laughter, their songs... Uh, of joy or, or being heard. And now here's the point I'm trying to make. The next verse says, Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. I want you to see it wasn't the army that conquered darkness in the world that caused the nations to say the Lord is with them. The Lord has done great things. It was the joyful disposition and the joyful and inspired and dream, life-giving, kind of dream-infused uh, culture of heaven that caused the people around them to say, God is doing something in that group. And I believe if we want to be a church that, uh, that, that is contagious, if you will, happy cultures are contagious. Joyful cultures are contagious. I don't know if you know this. I study this stuff all the time. But churches that are healthy and that grow usually score high On the laughter index. Please don't make me explain what the laughter index is, guys. Just means we laugh a lot. And and why is that? It's because joy is contagious. Uh, Joy actually opens up possibilities uh, for influence. If a person brings joy to you, you're more likely to hear what they have to say, uh, even in the hard times 
as well. I, I have a friend who is a, a Christian comedian, and he goes around, and he has some really great comedy. And so he was in this church a number of years ago, and he had this, this bit that he would always do. It, it killed everywhere he went. It was about uh, the innovation of cars. And, and so he's talking about, man, cars are like, they're driving themselves now. It's like the infotainment systems are so integrated, like the seats are more ergonomically designed. He said, with all of the progress though, and he turns around and he said, the thing that I've noticed that they still haven't innovated, it's still, it's still very difficult to find your kid's legs when you're trying to, to beat them. <laughs> People started laughing and he had this whole routine on just that thing, you know? And uh, it was funny. Everybody laughed. Everybody was uplifted except one person. And this woman, when the whole thing was over, she walks up to him, a very stern look on her face, and she said, I'd like to have your email address. And foolishly, he gave it to her. And uh, anyway, so two days later, he gets uh, uh, this very long email. He hits print, and it was 15 pages long. Now, if you, if you deal with customer service at all, or if you're in leadership at all, you know the longer a message, the less joy-filled it is. Come on, somebody. It doesn't take somebody 15 pages to say good job. And uh, so anyway, so he's reading this, and this person was like, this just devastated me that you would celebrate child abuse and that you would just make light of hurting small defenseless children, like 15 pages of just browbeating this guy. And he said, I felt horrible. And he said, I actually got emotional. I was like, I don't want to hurt people. I don't want them to think I'm insensitive to child abuse. Like he just, he was sick over it for, for days. And he just decided, you know what? It's just not worth it. I'm not going to do that bit anymore. And for three months, he took that bit out of his routine. And one night he was at another church and he's doing his routine. And he said, he said, guys, I memorized all my jokes, but in a moment, all of my jokes just left me. And the only one I could remember was the car joke. It's the only one. He said, you have to keep going. And so so I started talking about, you know, cars are innovative. And, and he said, I did the whole thing. And I talked about turn around and this one, and people are laughing. It brings the house down. And he said, but I had this thought like, oh, I hope I didn't hurt somebody else. And when the, when the whole thing was over, everybody's leaving. There's this one older man that just puts his finger up and he starts walking toward the comedian. And he's like, oh no, he wants to confront me. And so the guy walks up to him and says, hey, you did a good job tonight, but there is something I want to say to you. It has to do with one of your jokes. And the comedian was like, do you mean the one about the car? And he said, yes, sir. I need to say something. He said, what do you need to say? He thought he was about to get attacked, you know? And the old man said, if you just pump the brakes, it brings the kids right there where they need to be. All right. Now, now let me ask you something. Who would you rather do life with? Come on, guys, who would you rather do life with, the letter writer or the person who just rolls with something, right? That person who's joyful, there's something strengthening about a person who has joy, Ch churches that have joy. There's actually happy churches. There's a lot of healthy indicators in that. There's a lot of health that, that's in place for churches that, that are happy and joyful and that laugh and are high on the laughter index, and those are growing uh, churches. Now... God created us. How many of you know as a pastor, it's a good career move for me to believe that God created us? Okay, God created us with intentionality, and there are mechanisms of influence. There are things in our system, like rhythms in our system, that open us up for influence, and there are uh, disruptors to that that can close us down to being influenced. And so I want to talk to you about this, and people know this in sales uh, and, and other areas. They know to move people to action, there are some things that need to be in place. But sometimes in the church, we ignore that part because we think, oh, that can't be God, that's science. But God created people, and the science is just the observation of what God created. And so one of the things you may not know is a positive and uplifting conversation with somebody, listen, where they resonate with your jokes, where they get the stuff you're talking about. <clears throat> Let me just say this. There's another study on laughter that when you think, oh man, that person, that man is funny, that woman is hilarious, that the studies that are done on that, well, the people that we think are the funniest, usually they're not the people that make us laugh the most, but instead they're the people that laugh the most at what we say. All right, so you see what I'm saying, guys? There's some kind of resonance with somebody that's easy, it's, it's life-giving, it's positive, it's uplifting, and a conversation with someone else that, that fits that criteria 
tends to sync up, literally sync up your heart rate, your breathing. There's this alignment that takes place. And we, a lot of times we think of communication is only verbal, but actually our systems are communicating to people around us. Um, and it takes about 10 minutes for that uh, phenomenon to take place. It's something that you can study and it's very real. And the, the term for it is entrainment. It's when you and I kind of resonate with each other and it's usually positive and uplifting where we, we so sync up on kind of where we're coming from. Oh man, you get me, me too, you too. That we actually start to sync up our breathing patterns and our heart rate and in sales or in politics, in successful politics, uh, convincing someone to do something or to buy something is highly correlated to entrainment. Now God created us with these systems to be open to influence or closed to influence. What's amazing is one of the most uh, quick uh, facilitation kind of environments for entrainment is corporate worship. When we worship together, we all, we all begin to, at least the people that are in that moment, we begin to sync up. And, and you know, there are scriptures that talk about worshiping God as one or, or God raising up a nation of people as one man. There's something that happens when we all kind of link up together and our systems almost communicate and line up and then start to give to God something that he deserves. Another thing that causes entrainment is laughter. When people start to laugh, they begin to, you know, they call it icebreakers, right? Why? Because all those little obstacles and challenges to connection start to melt away and we begin to, to connect. Is this useful to you guys today? So most people, and this is when we're talking about having hard conversations with people or presenting truth to people, you have to understand something about the way we were created to receive input, to, to allow influence and credibility into our lives. Most people will reject even what is true unless they trust the presenter. Now, why is that important to us today? Okay, because we live in a world where every day you wake up and look at the news, it's worse than it was the day before. It's less hopeful. This group is more out of control. I'm more right than I was yesterday. And the world is going to hell in a handbag. It's like worse than it's ever been. It's just worse and it's worse and it's worse. And what we, and we feel very justified in feeling the way we do. And guys, there are things in our world that are terrible. And we need a revival in our land. We absolutely do. But you need to understand something about the human heart. The Bible says an offended person is, is harder to win over than a fortified city. Proverbs says it's easier to win a fortified city than an offended brother. All right? So you need to understand, while this, uh, while entrainment causes influence and credibility to go up, pain and politics creates a low teachability environment. That's the reason you never lose arguments on social media, but you never convince the other person either. I've never lost an argument a day in my life. But the person that argued with you for that, that whole time feels the same way. Right? And so we're in this environment where nobody's listening to each other. And we're part of the problem. We're part of the problem. We, when we engage in this political faction and stuff like this, and listen, be politically engaged, vote like you. Well, I'm not going to say it. I'll keep moving. Anyway, uh, you should vote. You should vote. It's a gift. And uh, we need to be involved. But when it comes to like dividing and like scare, fear mongering and all that stuff, some of, you, some of you guys are more addicted to the news than some people are to crack cocaine. I thought crack cocaine would pop. That would just sound good. You know? I don't even know what that is. Anyway, all right. But when there's pain and, and politics, teachability is low. And why is that? Why is that? Because you cannot antagonize someone and influence them at the same time. Right? When you antagonize somebody, those systems that sync up, they all shut down. And there's a disconnection. Right? Here's something else you, you know, but it's important to be reminded. When we're talking about the pharisectomy, listen, this is a message specifically for any one of you. You're concerned about the direction of your, your kids, your grandkids, your, your community, people that you care about. But you haven't found a way to be influential. You're just frustrated. Right? Here's something else you can, you can know. You can't transform, help to be an agent of healing in someone's pain, where you help transform it into a testimony. You can't transform pain and transmit pain into their life at the same time. 
I think sometimes we think we can do both. In fact, I think we think sometimes one is required to make the other thing happen. And we've, we've heard this for years, but this is so central to this message and so true. People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. You know? Um, so when you think about speaking truth to someone, right? And typically speaking truth to somebody just means something they don't either agree with yet, they don't see could be a blind spot. How many of you know that each of us has a blind spot? All right. The ones that did not raise your hand, that's your blind spot. (laughs) Just wanted to help you out. All right. And and we need people to speak into our lives. I had had a very dear friend, very good to me, very good friend. About six or seven years ago, he set up an appointment. When you have a friend set up an appointment, you're in trouble. Somebody? You're like, no, all my friends do that. You are a nerd, sir. (laughs) But anyway, so I had this friend set up an appointment. And so I had breakfast with this guy. And he said, hey, I need to say something to you. And he was just agonizing. He's like, I think this could hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. I want to help you. But I love you enough. I I, I need to say this. And I was feeling anxiety. Like, what are you going to say? And he said, I just feel like the last several weeks when you preach. And he started getting tears in his eyes because he didn't want to hurt me. So I feel like the last several weeks when you preached that it's come from a place of personal hurt. And he said, I know there have been some people that have been um, uh, your critics. And he said, I almost feel like you're using this, the platform to like argue back at some people instead of just serving God's people something that can bless them and enrich them. And oh man, it ticked me off. I, I was like, what are you talking about? I've been preaching the word of God, you know. Uh, <laughs> I started out defensive, but, it, but, but what happened was I started actually, what, what really hurt me or what, what made me a little angry was that he was right. And I didn't realize how obvious it was. And, and so I, then I teared up and I'm like, would you, would you pray for me and help me? Like, I, I need to forgive these people. The only way that I can minister to you effectively is to have short accounts in my own life <clears throat> so that I'm not like settling scores or something or trying to do passive aggressive stuff to people. That doesn't honor God at all. Now listen, that guy gave me something that I needed to hear, but he was uniquely positioned in my life to say something hard to me in a way that I could hear it. You see, relationships are a little bit like bank accounts. They require deposits. Some of you still don't know this about bank accounts. They require deposits before withdrawals. Uh, I had a friend, uh, a mentor actually, when I was younger, he said, it's expensive to live like a poor person. I said, what do you mean? He said, you write a check you don't have money for, it's $50 more expensive right out of the gate. You don't pay your bills, then your interest rate is 20% instead of 8% on loans. He said, it's expensive. Can I tell you something? It's expensive to live in a way where you're constantly trying to influence people without caring for them first. It's very, very expensive to live that way. All right, so what are the deposits? What are some of the withdrawals? What, what are we talking about? Well, some of them are just spending time with people. I'm a quality time guy, so if I really like you, I love the idea of spending one-on-one time. Uh, that, that just fills me up, okay? Now, some of you in the room, you're hearing that, oh, spending hours with someone. Like, would we be doing anything? No, we'd be talking. Some of you are like, that is hell. That is hell for me. I, I, I want to be redeemed from that place, right? So it's not the same for everybody. Some of you, it's acts of service. You know, don't, don't hang out with me. Just mow my grass, right? So our generosity, like give me a gift, uh, sacrifice. I, I would say another major deposit, guys, hear this, is just showing up for people. You know, my mom uh, died in 2016, which Mother's Day is a little complex for me because I'm so happy for like, you know, for moms everywhere and how important that is. It's, it's beautiful. And I, and I celebrate that with my wife and right. But, but it was a little bit, it's a little painful every year. And I can relate to some of you guys that approach a day like this with, with some complexity and, and I, and I feel for you. And I also, I want to challenge every one of you, like, let's celebrate moms. Even if you come from a painful place, like let's celebrate this day. It's a day worth, worth celebrating. Yes. And the idea of showing up, when my mom died, um, I had never cared about flowers before. I was like, why do people waste money on sending flowers to funerals? 
I didn't get it. And then it was my mom's funeral. And then I looked at every person who sent flowers. And it mattered to me so much. And I had a buddy that was a newer friend of mine who lived six and a half hour drive away in Texas. We, we, we had a funeral in a little town called Winsboro, Louisiana. Six and a half hours away, uh, a, a newer friend of mine named Jeff drove from his house to that little church to be there uh, for my mom's funeral. And I broke when I saw him. I, I just couldn't believe he would show up. You know, th- that really is a difference between uh, kind of fair weather friends and genuine friends. Genuine friends show up for you, right? And that's a deposit that we can make. These are things that we can do to create conditions really of just thriving in our lives. And it also prepares our hearts for the hard stuff when we have to make some of the withdrawals, which sometimes can be confrontation, like what I told you about with my friend, or very hard truth, or hey, our boundaries. Hey, you know what? I know you, I don't know if you mean well or if you don't. That's, that's really not even important for me. I just want you to know when this stuff happens, when this boundary is crossed, I, I just, I don't, I'm not comfortable with it. I don't allow it to have those conversations where it's like, you know, I'm just not going to be in an environment where this happens to me. All of this is important in healthy relationships. Now, two different people sharing the same truth with the same person can get two different results. If somebody had just walked up to me after Sunday, hey, sounds like you're a little bitter there, preacher. I probably would have. I love this young man waving to me. Thank you. God bless you. He was not listening to a word I was saying, but he was pumped to see me right there. Hey, buddy. Good to see you, buddy. I love that. I don't know what I was saying, but I'm sure it was really good. All right. So so if somebody had come up to me with kind of a mean-spirited attitude, had not invested in the relationship, and then just wanted to critique uh, what I was preaching, I mean, you guys know this, right? This is basic stuff. My heart's not going to be open to hear what that person has to say. And so the result, two different people sharing the same truth, really can, depending on their approach, can, can trigger either rebellion or life change in the life of the other person. So then it's important for us, especially if we want to help people around us hear what is true and kind of be led on the path of life everlasting then ask yourself, have you earned the right to share the truth through sacrificial love? Now, I've been in church my whole life. And when I preach messages like this, typically somebody's going to come up to me and say this, preacher, we can't, we can't compromise on this stuff. We got to call a spade a spade because the gospel is offensive. Can I tell you something? It is offensive. It's exclusive. Now, that's not God's heart. God's intention is that every person would say yes to Jesus. And every person would be reconciled to the Father through His Son. But people have free will, and the people that choose to to reject the gospel find great offense in the gospel and find it to be exclusive. Is that fair to say? Okay, that's absolutely true. But what I find is most of the time the people that say this are just offensive people. And actually use the gospel incorrectly. They're just jerks. And sometimes being a jerk costs you influence. In fact, it always does. Okay? And so you can see, even with God, he, he talks about this, this idea of him first doing something for us so that then we can respond in a correct way. Look at this. First John for says, we love because God first loved us. There's this deposit of love into us, and then we're able to give it back, give it to other people. Matthew 10, 8 says, freely you have received. That means that, that it started with somebody making a deposit into our lives. And so then the command is freely give. One of the things I say a lot around here is God gives us so many good things, and all he ever asks of us is that we give it away is that we're not the destination, we're just a conduit to let that grace, that forgiveness, that redemption just flow through us to the world around us. Romans 2, it's like, this world needs to repent. Yes, and God's kindness is intended to lead people to repentance. If you preach a message of repentance to the world, to the church, that is void of God's kindness, you're doing it wrong.
So how can I make deposits of care and love into people so they can hear truth from me? Right? There are ways we can do this. I want to talk about how to do... This is an important question to ask yourself. It's like, have I created the conditions to do confrontation? And then once I have, can I do this effectively? A couple things I want to... Just some pro tips I want to give you guys on uh, confrontation because I've been confronted a lot, so I know what I'm talking about. I need a lot of confrontation in my life. All right? First, this is so powerful. Honor publicly, confront privately. Honor publicly, confront privately. Whenever there are people that will come to this church from another church and they got hurt at their last church and they want to come to me, tell me how terrible uh, their pastor was. And I I get it. But at the same time, can I tell you something? I'm not going to entertain that story. Even if I don't know them, I'm going to look at you, make eye contact, and I'm going to say, that's a great church. That guy's my best friend. I don't really say that, but I thought it was funny. But I will say that's a great church doing great things because I don't want to build a connection on, on dishonoring somebody who's not even in the room to share their side. Right? So honor publicly, confront privately. Pastor, why, why do you say such good things about somebody and then, and then they're not on the staff later? You're welcome. All right. Don't smear, gossip, or triangulate. That means whenever there's conflict, a lot of times we're tempted to get, bring in all of our allies in the community to see things our way so that person doesn't have uh, uh, a lot of agreement within the community. That's not a healthy way to do it. Okay? Go to that person privately. The Bible's actually really clear. Matthew 18, if somebody's overtaken in a fault, there's a sin, go to that person privately privately. If they can be reasoned with, then you've won, you've won a brother, you've won a sister. But if they can't, just bring a couple of witnesses. So you're not building a coalition against them. You just want accountability there because light works that way. It's a disinfectant. And if that doesn't work, then you bring in the church, right? So that, that's a very powerful tool at that point. But there's, there's something there about going to them privately instead of just smearing them all over the place. Here's another one. If you want someone to hear truth or you want to see their life change, pray for them. Like, dedicate time to pray. If you really believe prayer worked, you'd pray about everything. I'll say it again. If you really believe that, that when you prayed, you were talking to the king of the universe with unlimited power to do something in your life, you would pray about more things. Right? And so, uh, set aside some, some situation or a person in your life. Set aside 10 minutes and just say, God, I don't even know what... Maybe for some of you, it's not a rhythm in your life, prayer. And so you're like, I don't know what to say, but I'm going to sit here and I, I just, maybe I'm going to think positive thoughts or maybe I'm going to think mean thoughts. You know, it's like, read the Psalms. That'll give you a lot of good ammo to pray uh, against your enemies and uh, dash their teeth from their mouths. And then you'll get past that into the grace stuff, you know, <laughs> right? But, but pray. I have seen this work in such dramatic ways when I've just been frustrated by something, frustrated by something. And then I just start praying about it. I just go to God every day. It's amazing how quickly things begin to move when God's people start to pray. Now this next one, I think, especially if you're talking about keeping influence of people in conflict, this is huge. Do not judge the hearts or motives of people. Everybody look at me. This, this really is kind of the takeaway of the day. Pastor, are you saying I don't know the heart of another person? Oh, it's deeper than that. I'm telling you, you don't even know your own heart. In fact, David prays, God, search me, know my heart. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in a path everlasting. What is he saying? David's saying, there are times I don't even know if my heart's right. So I gotta possibly know yours. Okay, and what happens is when we correct people, we think we see right through them and we start judging their motives and their hearts and we're almost all the time we're wrong. And so then that person starts out in confrontation being misunderstood and judged for something that's not true. But instead, we can assess words and actions. Like, hey, I noticed you were late to work three days in a row. Like, that's something that's fair to say. I don't know the reasons for it, but I just want you to know, like, I've noticed, and maybe we should talk about that. Do you guys see the difference between that and saying, you are a lazy bum, you are robbing me of 15 minutes of wages because you show up late. You're a thief and a liar. You know, it's like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. You need to be put in a padded room somewhere. 
Not judging your heart, I'm just saying you're crazy. <laughs> All right. So here are three questions you can ask yourself which can lead to greater influence. In other words, there's a way to kind of approach all of this stuff right now with some kind of self-awareness. Okay, so I want to go through those, those few questions. Is this useful to you guys today? First one is, who, who are you feeling stressed with right now? Like, who, gosh, because sometimes we're so disconnected from our emotions, we don't even realize, I'm upset. I'm upset. It's because somebody's doing this thing or they're acting this way or they're, they're off track and I'm concerned for them. And even pray about it. Like, God, help highlight those areas that need some attention. Number two, what are some practical ways to make deposits of love into their lives? Like, how can I add value? I don't want to be the person that when I open my mouth to speak truth, it drives them further away from God. Instead, I want to be a cheerleader for the human race. I want to be for that person. I want to be their biggest fan and their biggest supporter so that their heart is wide open to hear what they need to hear. And by the way, I want that in my life too, so people can speak into my life. And then are these deposits uniquely valuable to them? It's kind of like what I was saying earlier. Maybe for some people, they, they would just love some quality time with you. Maybe other people, it's like, I, I don't have time to just hang out with you, but I could use a little help working on this project, you know. And if you and I could have the disposition to say, I'm going to care for someone in a way that's uniquely meaningful to them, then that can create some great conditions for us to be really honest and authentic with each other. And these questions force us into a position of humility. Um, when I was 14, I took driver's education. And the state trooper he was a large man. He, uh, he was teaching driver's ed, very authoritative. And he was talking about the right of way. And he was talking about being a cautious driver and he asked some questions and one of the students said, oh no, I wouldn't slow down because I have the right of way. And he was saying, you should be cautious. But this kid was saying, yeah, but I have the, but I have the right of way. And then the, the cop, the state trooper walked over to him and said, young man, do you know that you can be right and still be dead? Just because we have the right of way doesn't mean we're out of danger. Just because we have the truth doesn't mean we're bringing on anything healthy at all. It could just be a car wreck. And this allows us to be a little more cautious in our approach. And God honors that. The Holy Spirit honors that. God opposes pride but gives grace to the humble. And my prayer for you is that you would be a student of truth that you would be somebody who pursues God, that you would be aware of what's going on in our world and recognize that our purpose is to do something about that, is to bring light into a dark world, but that we would do it in a way that honors God, that reflects the character of God, the joy of the kingdom, and is effective. Last thing I want to say, and it's kind of in the spirit of this message, I want to ask you to come into a partnership with me. There are some things that you can do that I cannot. And there are some things that I can do, perhaps, that you can't do. What you can do that I can't is you can know all of your friends and coworkers and family members. And you can invite them to church. And what I can do that perhaps some of you cannot is present Jesus in a way that they will accept. Right? And if we work together, I think we'll see some incredible things happen in our families in our world that desperately, that desperately needs the light of the gospel to shine again. Amen. God's glad you came to church today. What I want to do right now is speak to a group of you in the room. You know you're not right with God and you want to get right with God today. If that's you, I want to pray for you right where you sit. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way, but I would like to know who I'm praying for. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm the only one looking around. If that's you and you would say, hey, pastor, pray for me today. Would you raise your hand so I can see you? I just want to know who I'm praying for. And just keep your hands up for just a moment. I want to acknowledge every single one of you. God bless. We are so thankful you were able to join us today. Before we wrap up our worship experience, I want to give you an opportunity to take that first step in starting a personal relationship with Jesus. If you want to take that step, just pray this prayer along with me. Dear Lord Jesus, 
I know that I have sinned and have lived life my own way, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In your name, amen. If you made that decision and prayed that prayer with me today, we would love to follow up with you to give you next steps on your spiritual journey. Just follow the link in the description that says, I made the decision to follow Jesus. The best next step for anyone who has made a decision to follow Jesus is to get plugged into a healthy community. And we would love for that to be Res Church. We'd also invite you to check out our growth track, Seven Minute Start. If you've never gone through growth track, it is now an easy and on-demand process that you can experience at your own pace, wherever you are and whenever you want. This is a great way that we can help you discover the purpose that God has created you for and how you can use that purpose to make a difference in the world. You can find the link for Growth Track in the description of this video. You will also find links to follow us on social media, visit our website, connect with us, or request prayer. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope to connect with you soon, and we will see you again next week for church in person or online.